Okay, so uh, we're making some good progress through the material um, as we look forward to day three. Um, in day two, um, uh, we explored uh, a set of topics which, uh, while broad, really concentrated on undertaking a, a very common task uh, with modeling, a task that uh, is just about as ubiquitous as the need to incorporate dynamics into a model to have the model evolve over time. We need the ability to report on that evolution. And that reporting, those so-called observer processes, don't shape the evolution of the model, but they do help us understand that evolution. And it's really modeling as learning that often motivates us and requires that understanding to be built up. So it's virtually universal that when you build a model, you'll have some sort of processes to report on that model over time. And yesterday we saw a set of such processes. Wait, you might want to get your video off. Um, so uh, we saw a set of those processes. Um, some processes reported on uh, reported cross-sectional statistics within the model, such as the count of the number of smokers or count of the number of people with heart disease, et cetera. Others reported on historical information. Uh, for example, the number of times that an individual had quit smoking, or in a particularly finessed example, the cumulative time that a person spent smoking. Yet other information reported that we incorporated in our final session was not cross-sectional. Um, it wasn't historical summaries, it was rather information, what I what I termed uh, flow statistics or change over time. Um, it was information related to quantities such as incidents. The number of people, for example, who started smoking within the past year, who developed heart disease in the past year, who died in the past year. That's not a statistic that you can stop the model at a single time, freeze time, as it were, and count up, right? We can do that with the kind of smokers. We can imagine freezing time in the model on a particularly cold day here in Saskatchewan, and we could go through and count the number of frozen individuals who are smokers, um, so to speak. Um, or the number of individuals with heart disease. Um, by contrast, these flow statistics, these are, these are things that play out over a period of time, like the number that have developed heart disease in the past year. And that required different mechanisms. We saw we needed to sort of, an easy way to do it is with a tally, we tally up throughout the period of interest, really accumulating over the period of interest and then reporting and clearing that tally. But this issue of reporting is one that follows us along regardless if, if even with the most simple models or the most complex ones. And, you know, I, I did just want to nod, um, give a nod to uh, a component of modeling that I've referred to glancingly, but I think it's really important. When I started as a modeler, uh, between my undergrad and, and grad, started building my first research-based, um, agent-based models. And a couple of year, years later, system dynamics models um, to deliver for clients. We, um, I, was, I was very much interested in the technical side of it, the underlying mathematics, the structure of these models. Um, and I didn't give as much thought, certainly not as much attention uh, as, as was merited to things about the modeling process, the 
the human feature of modeling. I was focused on building useful models, but not necessarily building useful models that always got used reliably, because that requires something more than a really um, a really uh, well-designed model, more than technical excellence. It requires attention to modeling. And one very important component of that modeling is the ability to tell stories from models. It's the ability to use a model to tell effective stories, tell powerful stories. And this, like participatory methods, um, was kind of outside my scope, my, my sphere of, of uh, consideration in my day-to-day -day practice then. But over time, I embraced it. And uh, I learned that telling stories with models meant that the models could go a lot further. They could have much more impact. They could welcome critique much more effectively. And their recommendations would be more likely to actually um, be translated into action. And I just want to highlight this, this, these things that we talked about yesterday, modest though they may seem, in the weeds so they may see with functions and variables, temporary variables, and so on. Um, it's easy to lose track of the fact that when we're collecting information about on a model's behavior over time, often we're building up the information that we need to tell an important story with that model. And almost invariably, or often that story is one over time. We're telling stories with the model um, about how things occur over time. We may tell a story about a policy, policy A and policy B, and policy B is yields more gain than policy A, but policy A has positive impacts, shows positive impacts much earlier than, than policy B. Um, so there's bigger gain with policy B, maybe big, bigger bang for the buck, greater cost effectiveness, but policy A shows its gains earlier. That's a common story that you can study with these sorts of models because they play out their effects over time. Or we may see that, well, policy B yields get great gains, but at first, it'll, it may actually look worse. Maybe you're discovering lots of hidden cases of a condition. And your numbers look a lot worse because oh, it seems like there's a lot more cases. We must not be doing our job well because we have all these, you know, unexpected cases of some communicable disease or some chronic condition. But it turns out that that's indeed making progress. Um, it may seem uh, conversely like it's bad because you know, where the number of cases of heart disease in the population seems to be going up. You know, people per 100,000 with heart disease is higher now and it's rising. And then they seem like an incipient crisis if you don't understand the dynamics. Um, but if you are in the know and you realize that's because of falling mortality rates for people with, with heart disease, better, better care for them, that's a success. Models help you tell stories effectively and they help head off misunderstandings in the stories that are mere fables that don't have any basis to them. But with an agent-based model, we can tell stories especially effectively compared to a compartmental model because we can tell stories that are much richer, that have to do with inequities, um, capturing the heterogeneity of the population. Stories that have to do with, with lifetimes of, of history, uh, of the adverse childhood experiences, um, or early childhood um, in conditions of adversity that play out then over the life course, or about critical periods in a person's life that head them in different directions. Agent-based models are very good for capturing path dependence, cases where two people start in fairly similar circumstances, but they end up diverging in their trajectories because of some 
earlier life, you know, problem, for example, with an ever childhood experience on one part that didn't occur to the other early experience of trauma that lead them to go in very different directions. That's really only, uh, it's extremely cumbersome and awkward and really crude at best to explore with a compartmental model. With an agent-based model, we can really capture that and we can tell the stories associated with them. And while we were accumulating information at an individual level on people, um, on the number of quit attempts or how cumulative time that they spent smoking, it's conceivable that it would have struck one of you that beyond you know this bookkeeping for when they last started smoking and, and what was their total time spent smoking before this current bout, Beyond all that sound and fury, we were doing something pretty profound there. We were recording marks in the history of a person. And sometimes that information can tell powerful stories. I, I want to I wanna just give you a glimpse. I'm, I'm not going to talk about this model unless there was huge interest, although it is a point of pride in some of its creators uh, are amongst the the stalwart and esteemed TAs of this very event. But I want to show you um, a, uh, a picture uh, from one of these models of a story told at an individual level. This is a model of polysubstance use. Um, uh, and Jenna and Matthews and Nona uh, here... Uh, Larissa and uh, a, form, a graduate of our lab, Jalen, variety of others, Narges have have helped build this up, and it shows um, um, it depicts in a poly substance use context um, people's history and decision making and availability and access to services, etc. And and it records information about people over time, not just in one domain, uh, the domain of substance use. I'm sorry, I, I need to, what I should really do is to consolidate this. I'm I'm uh, robbing Peter to pay Paul. I'm, I'm showing it for the remote people, but not for the locals. So I'm going to shift to that, share my other screen, and then, um, uh, we will drag this offending block out of the way. Um, so, so this depicts a sort of story coming out of that model for an individual involving occurrences of use of some substance um, secondary to occurrence of chronic pain earlier in life. This is, is not, not shown here, this is just a glimpse for a certain period um, where they're dealing with uh, chronic pain issues. Maybe it's lower back pain. Maybe, you know, they were working in an occupation that, that um, led to, um, uh, led to back injury as a nurse or as a construction worker or what have you. Um, they began use of illicit opioids in the form of uh, Vicodin or hydrocodone here. And uh, they were, they were working. Um, for a while, um, but had a period of, of dysfunctional, I need to bring that over, I'm sorry for the remote folks, I'll zoom out here, and um, there we go, and we'll see about, um, and uh, they, they encountered some you know, uh, challenges in their employment, probably associated with um, uh, a new use of illicit opioids, uh, uh, ultimately became became unemployed. Um, but they they uh, overdosed from a substance. Uh, it looks like in this case it wasn't due to adulteration, although we have that in another model. Um, Prior to that, they sought to engage in substance use treatment pathways, but uh, tragically, it wasn't enough to reach them before um, 
they consume some fentanyl and it looks like that triggered uh triggered their death here. Oh, we could actually look into the model to find out the exact sequence. But the point is this is a ton. This tells a story. It tells a story of suffering. It tells a story of struggle. It tells a story, you know, dealing with, with back pain and, and trying substances to try to um uh, to try to escape it. Other stories might involve um uh you know use of uh, of several drugs, right? Um in this case, uh, uh, initially prescription hydromorphone, um, but uh, use of a, a totally different class of drugs, um, methamphetamines, uh, and uh, and use of a drug ultimately that was laced with fentanyl and contributed to their death. Um, when despite engaging with some um, some clinics that that provide uh, access to addiction medicine. Um, so these are stories and they're stories to which people with lived experience can relate and critique. So when we engage with people with lived experience, um, one of the more powerful tools at a community level or an individual level is to tell these stories. It's to have the model report, not just numbers, but to report stories. And that is possible with an agent-based level, an agent-based model, in a way that would be completely impossible to tell at an individual level, at a level of individuals' experiences with a with a compartmental model. So models tell stories, and stories change models. Stories elicit understanding. Stories bring out tacit understanding that might not otherwise be mentioned. Stories are things people to which people can relate and they may find some stories implausible in a way that you've brought out some understanding that might not have otherwise have, have been triggered. Um, in other cases, it, it, it brings out other aspects of their experience that they might not have mentioned. So Jenna, early on, weighed Larissa here and her work, uh, you know, have all made made use of storytelling for models. So when we accumulate information, it can sometimes seem like a bore. You know, sometimes seem seem um like this chore to to be undertaken with a model, this bookkeeping, and you know, accumulating away this information. But remember that effective storytelling can be really enhanced by that sort of information. And tapping into stories that are about people over time, about geography, about um, responses of the model to interventions, um, about people's social network, can often shed uh, light and uh, on on what's going on with the model, but can also help elicit understanding, critique, and uh, uh, and and welcome the sort of uh, uh, suggestions and criticism that will help advance the model, as well as when it comes to the policy regime, help help people contextualize why certain interventions are effective, et cetera. So um, we, we have our any logic models uh, for some of the models producing stories like this at a more fine-grained level. This um, is something that some of the models I've provided you, the 100 or so, I think there's one or two that accumulate this sort of information. And there's external tools we use. This is produced by an R library for producing timelines that we use to produce these, these sort of timeline depictions of it, which weave together information from different domains involving care seeking, involving you know, use of prescription opioids, uh, involving uh, life events and visits to clinics, et cetera, into um, into a, a single time. So we may have been doing things that seem just awfully technical and dry yesterday, 
but it, these are things that let us undertake tasks of great importance in this human feature of modeling that help us learn more deeply, more reliably, more rigorously, and more quickly, and that help us leverage that village that really help us build an effective model. Regardless of people's backgrounds, people can understand stories. Okay, so just a reflection from yesterday. We okay with that? Okay, so I, I think I'll stop my uh, retrospective re prepared remarks there, but I wanna use this time to elicit questions. Um, I'm sure some of you were struggling with processing some of what we've seen. Um, some of you may be wondering about um, about the broader implications of items that we've seen. Others may be wondering about potential uses of these methods or, or um, trade-offs, um, negative sides of them. So I'd like to use this time right now to, to welcome any questions or um, uh, or you know comments or suggestions um, uh, from those present remotely or those present uh, physically in the room. So what what could we um, help address uh, for you? Please feel free to to do it also if you're a student. Um, uh, I'd welcome it from certainly from the the many students in the room. So any any questions you would like to put forward? Requests for types of material? Is there anything you want to see more of? Or things you've heard about that you'd like to see more about? Yes, Jeff. When it comes to uh, setting the parameters in models, um, mm -hmm. uh, what would constitute a, a good source of information for the values that we would put into those parameters? Great, great question. Um, so uh, there are many um, sources of information in models, and I, I We'll just see if within 30 seconds, I could find a slide that might provide a more persistent sort of record of some of my comments, but um, I can uh, make um, make some remarks uh, off the top of my head. Um, uh, so I've mentioned that models are, uh, models bring together lines of evidence in theory to to help us uh, better understand the world, help us uh, think more reliably uh, through uh, through the consequences of actions or to interpret data, and. Uh, Knowledge about the world, evidence at some level, um, makes its way into, in the form of parameters. It also is captured commonly in the structures of the model. For example, we might have a model depicting diabetic um, uh, stages of, of diabetes and, or, or dysglycemia more generally. We might have prediabetes um uh in a bidirectional relationship with with normal glycemia and then a progression on to early type 2 for dealing with type 2 diabetes and then uh diabetes existing without complications then microvascular macrovascular or we may have stages of um 
chronic kidney disease from diabetes, which have stages one through five, proceeding on to end-stage renal disease with either dialysis or, or, or transplant, for example, as options. All of these things um, incorporate, or very commonly, those incorporate evidence. But one of the places that's very important for incorporating evidence is parameter values. It's particular places where we assume things. I've argued uh, within this, um, from this podium, that often it's the structure that's the more foundational determiner of behavior, but parameters matter. And we sweat parameters, we sweat parameter values. So I'd like to talk, where do parameters come from? Commonly in models, this is a system dynamics model, but um, you know we, we will see this for uh, agent-based models as well. Commonly, there's a variety of sources that we seek to try to find for parameter values. Sometimes these are available, sometimes not. Um, there are some parameter values that can come from randomized control trials. Um, uh, there are some that can come from certain types of clinical reports. You know, if you're dealing with diabetes, there's certain types of um, insulin clamps or glucose clamp type studies um, from, from clinical settings. Uh, there's times where from interventions, um, the the observation of the gain from an intervention, the uh, level of smoking reduction or reduction of re relapse that comes from use of a nicotine patch uh, or nicotine gum, you might you might find out what's observed for that from actual intervention studies for people who are using that compared to people not using it and use that as the basis for a parameter estimate. Now, uh, in some cases, uh, certain types of surveillance data may be very relevant. For example, from the CCHS, the Canadian Community uh, Health Survey, or in the uh, US, the NHANES, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or the NHIS, the National Health uh, Interview Survey, um, or various other instruments uh, that are more specialized, like the behavioral risk factor surveillance system or the youth behavioral uh, surveillance uh, system, risk factor uh, surveillance system. These are sources that provide estimates in a population of some quantities. Maybe it's number of relapse attempts per year. Those would be more of a flow quantity. Maybe it's um, the fraction of people of a certain age um, who initiate smoking, okay? And that sort of information might then be incorporated into certain parameters. Maybe you want to start the model with a certain fraction of people divided into different smoking status categories. And you're going to look at prevalence data from those instruments, those, those um, surveys that have been conducted. Um, uh, those are sources of certain types of information, like on initial state. And uh, to whet your appetite, Jeff, um, I will note that um, um, these are, I will emphasize that, you know, most of these, you're going to be working with secondary data, data that was collected, not with this modeling study in mind, but which you can tap to inform the modeling study or these parameter estimates, Okay. Um, and sometimes those estimates of those parameters um, for uh, these studies will be um, uh, will involve significant amounts of statistical analysis using that secondary data. Okay, so um, uh, when I wore a younger man's shoes and I was working on uh, models, you know, I remember spending um, much time conducting statistical analyses on secondary data sources and using them to estimate maybe a survival analysis or competing risks analysis and using it to estimate, um, you know, mean time in certain states of a model, for example, uh, et cetera. So the statistical tests that you've learned about in your studies uh, have some relevance here. Um, and uh, often we mine the literature, uh, Sela is, is well aware of this, we mine the literature to try to find these data.
Um, but I will say further that, you know, I've always, since my undergrad days, um, uh, since starting out also as a, as a data scientist, although the term wasn't uh, current at that time, it wasn't really known. Um, you know, I've always felt like um, it would be um, really nice if we didn't have to be so dependent on secondary data sources for areas where we do tremendous amounts of work. Maybe it's long COVID. Maybe it's issues having to do with diabetes and renal dysfunction. Maybe it's issues having to do with, uh, you know, uh, intimate partner violence or issues having to do with, um, uh, with suicide prevention. Uh, we, when we're working in areas, we will sometimes collect our own data. And the argument I made is that as a modeler, I've, I long felt frustrated by being what I view as kind of a data buzzard, where I I just live off an unseemly diet of roadkill of like secondary data, you know, that I find. I, I just go opportunistically, I find this article, find that article, find this survey, find that, find that instrument, come across this, this published estimate, come across a report from this study, which said this came across these reports from the UK, you know, health ministry office where they estimated this fraction of people with long COVID symptom or what have you. I, I always felt that it was a shame as I build my model, these really sophisticated models that I have to, I have to survive on other people's discards, like what they happen to publish. I always felt that was unfortunate. Again, I, I definitely had the image of a butt being a buzzard, you know, just eating roadkill on the side of the road that others happen to 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 to, 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 to hit and uh, end up there. So at some point, I resolved. By God, I can build platforms to collect this data. Like I don't have to live off a of roadkill. Okay, um, I can be a chef. Um, I can grow my own, I can have a garden. I can grow my own food. And I can grow a pretty damn good garden. Um, so I think you know where this is going. I said, these smartphones are really becoming things. How if we built a platform for smartphones for flexible collection of epidemiological data, right? Um, which... We, we avoid the need for programming by making it really configurable. So it's really easy to set up studies, right? Um, and to configure studies, to design custom survey instruments triggered by environmental context or triggered by answers to other questions. And suppose we make it really easy to collect sensor data along with that, right? And of course, Ethica was born, right? Um, and Ethica became Avicenna Health and it's been used in hundreds of studies worldwide. And a lot of it is motivated by I'm sick of being a data buzzard, and I'm not going to take it anymore. Um, I'm going to collect my own information um, about things I care most about. I, I can launch studies of our own and something like long COVID. We can launch a study to look at occurrence of, you know, um, of, of difficult thoughts on the part of those with teen mental health in schools. And Lo and behold, um, in 2024, I hired someone named Jeff Klassen, who, who uh, you know, is doing work with Laura on these studies of teen mental health. And a lot of the goals of collecting data from those studies are to inform parameter estimates in the model. But they don't, th those parameter estimates don't fall out of the data. How do we turn the data into parameter estimates? Uh, well, we use a set of techniques which often critically involve statistical techniques mm -hmm, for arriving at those estimates. And they may be statistical techniques of many different sorts. I've mentioned some in the survival analysis tradition, right? Um, but others involve uh, uh, different you know, areas of statistics. Um, some involve simple statistical models, Bayesian statistical models. And some of my 
favorite collaborators are people that you and I have worked with and published papers with, like Zhu Xiong Liu, to help arrive at these parameter estimates, okay? Um, so I ain't gonna take it anymore. <laughs> I'm not gonna run my own studies and we're gonna collect our own data with questions designed to inform models. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're doing with long COVID. That's why we pick our questions carefully. That's why Jenna and I were working long hours after my you know, hackathon sessions over in Edinburgh to pick questions that can inform whose answers can allow us to undertake the data analysis, the, the statistical analysis that will inform model parameters, okay? So if you can collect, if you can have partnerships with people who collect data, modeling becomes much more powerful yet because you can, you can, um, you don't have to depend as much on secondary data sources. You can grow your own food. And if I could just put a further point on that, um, uh, do I still have this, um, uh, this up? No, I don't. Um, but I will, I will just uh, call this up here. I just want to remind you of one picture, which we showed from these screens, not two days thence. Um, so we had a picture involving modeling in its relationship with uh, with um, collecting uh, collecting data and um, and undertaking interventions. And I will just see, okay, for some reason it's not, I know exactly what I'm looking for, but I'm not I'm not seeing it somehow. Maybe it's maybe it's this one. No, that's um, but it basically showed how um, it exists in a interplay with here it is. Yeah, it's just one of the blank ones shown in the slide sorter. Okay. I'm gonna share my screen here for those remote. So um where's our where's our little panel? Hey, come on. Uh why why am I not seeing this this uh panel to enable screen sharing? Wait, could you um no you can't do it. I'm not seeing the Zoom panel to enable screen sharing here. Ah, here we go. Um, doo -doo -doo. Okay, uh, blah, blah. Uh, here we go. Happy, happy. Oh, parts of the slide didn't load. Show it anyway. There we go. So when we have a model, we have a simulation model. Um, I've argued that much of its purpose is to refine our mental model and uh, we use that model um, to we, we capture aspects of our mental model we run simulations we observe data and we compare it often with observations of the world but we learn from these simulations Often we see unreasonable behavior or behavior that surprises us and leads us to modify the model, modify our mental model. Sometimes we think see things that are absurd. We further modify our mental model and our physical model. But one of the most powerful things you can do is collect data from the model for the world that will help inform the model. Um, go get additional sources of data. Um, there's a case here in Saskatchewan um, for some of our earlier work on diabetic on diabetes, where you know the, the results of the model um, convinced us of the importance and the urgency of getting certain types of data um, to inform this model. It was a point of great uncertainty in the model, and sensitivity analyses showed that model results would be significantly affected by. Um, the assumptions uh, associated with that area of the model. And it convinced us, you know, um, we need to get that data, you can bring paying for it. So we paid our Ministry of Health to extract the data from population-wide administrative databases, which allowed us to get those estimates, compute the estimates, put it into the model. 
and and you said uh, in our in our model and all, um, it was worth tens of thousands of dollars uh, to us. Uh, it's actually about twelve thousand. Um, but um, other cases, if you can intervene, you can also test what your model thought would happen versus what's actually observed. And you can learn from that and refine your model. So one of the most effective ways of refining your model is through you know, deliberate uh, observations, collecting observations from the world to inform it on the one hand, but also inter having, having the opportunity to see the results of interventions. Those may be natural experiments. You know, smartphones are banned in schools. You observe what will happen empirically like with uh, Ethica, um, versus what the model anticipates, and then you update the model. It could be a natural experiment like that. It's, it's not undertaken for this purpose. The intervention isn't undertaken for the first purpose, but it's it's just something that happens to occur at the time. Or it could be you know motivated by the model, like you know the initial the initial public health orders put into place in this province based on you know, within hours of our modeling recommendations to the ministry coming out, they put those into place and we can observe the results and refine them off. And that's that's what we do scientifically, right? We undertake actions and observe in a physical setting, right? Um, and it's what we can do in the world when we're lectured that when we're lucky enough to have interventions that the model can anticipate what will happen. And we we um, uh, we see the actual effects of the intervention. We approve the model. So all those things can be used to to help inform model estimates. But the fact is, the fact is that um, sometimes that's not enough, and when we end up undertaking some of uh, having recourse to some additional sources of information. Um, one of them is expert judgment. I'll be with you in just a minute, Clarissa. Um, one of them is expert judgment, okay? Um, so there are times where, I've seen it done through a Delphi process um, that probably is not a familiar name to you, but it may be for others here, a structured process for soliciting expert judgments on a particular topic. My colleague Gary Brute, who you've met actually, um, and some other here uh, that Jenna's worked with, um, some he keeps running a uh, Delphi process right now for our long COVID process, for example. And you can use expert judgment to try to arrive at plausible estimates for parameters that are not going to be perfect, but they're probably pretty well grounded, and and. They won't be they won't be perfect, but that's not the nature of the world. Um, uh, and the model's not perfect, um, but they're likely a lot better than uh, what an MIT is known as a wag, which is a wild best guess. Um, you know, it's it's a lot better than my guess. Um, uh, but we'll, we'll turn to expert judgment. This is quite common. Um, uh, but there are times where we can essentially look at model outcomes, the outcomes of a model in comparison with observed data and, and estimate the parameter um, from that. And there's a whole process we'll talk about Friday called calibration and a process um, that's known as statistical filtering um, that can be used to estimate parameter values over time based on observed data and based on model behavior to estimate parameter values informed by what the model estimates and uh, for quantities versus what's actually observed for the quantities. It kind of zeroes in on, on what the values of the parameters likely are. And these are very widely used techniques in areas like robotics and like um, uh, like inertial guidance systems for planes and 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 uh, for for uh, rockets, etc. Um, 
So there, we, we take advantage of the fact that, here's the thing, he says, all right, I need to, I need to emphasize this. There's many spheres of tools used in health and in many other areas, business and other you know, government spheres of decision-making where we need to make some decision, maybe through risk analysis, decision analysis, and we need parameter estimates for it. the decision tree. And so we we put in estimates uh, along with those things. In that context, um, uh, you know, you you rightfully well ask to do sensitivity analysis and so on because the the results of the model are directly contingent on these parameter values, okay? They're, they're, they directly reflect the parameter values. If you're, if you're off with the parameter values, the analysis will be undercut in its, its accuracy, its effectiveness, and its recommendation of what decision to take at what time will be really impacted by the particular assumptions. Dynamic models are not like that. They're actually much less contingent. And I'll tell you, I'll give you three reasons why. Okay? Three reasons why. Number one, simulation models, please, are not merely downstream of, of, of data. They don't merely consume data in some with some inordinate appetite and produce results. No, no, no. What, what happens is that data engages with the model at two different points, okay, in a big way. And it can inform the model at two different points in a big way. One way is by parameters. The other way is that the model is not merely on the consuming side, it's on the producing side of data it produces emergent behavior, okay? So we run this model, right? We ran this model, right? Um, let's, I'm gonna run this model just to remind you to, to, to bring this point home, okay? So here we go, here we go. I'm gonna, where's my any logic? Where is my any logic? Hey, where is it? Anyone see? What? Mm -hmm. where, where'd any logic go? I had it up here just, oh, there it is. There it is. Okay. Happy, happy. I don't have my glasses. Okay. So here's our smoking and heart disease model. And this model has parameters in it, right? Look at this. A parameter. Well, it's population size, particularly simple, but implicit in this. If this were a real model, we'd be more careful. We'd put in parameter values for this and this. These things that are given as relapse rates. Or, or cessation rates, quitting rates, or initiation assumptions, or developing heart disease, um, or the, the, the mortality rate from healthy heart, those would be parameter values in the model. Now, those are downstream of data. You have to put things in. But here's the thing, because if you run this model, you will, you will see behavior observed, right? See that data? You see it? Yeah? Even I can see it here, um, right? Um, even without my glasses. See this data on heart disease? See this data on smoking, right? Do you see this data on the count of quit people uh, have undertaken? You see this data on cumulative time smoked? You see that? See this data on annual heart disease incidents, right? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be with you and Larissa in just a minute. I just want to get through this there. Um, so... Uh, so see that data. Those are all output from the model, right? Are those are those particular outputs influenced by do, can can each of those outputs be reduced to one parameter value? Like like is this top one this heart disease? Um, uh, this is uh, this is heart disease incident. Um, you tell me, is that affected by the assumptions about 
this right here. Is it affected by that? Yeah, yeah, it's affected by that. Is that the only thing it's affected by? The assumptions about this? This, this certainly if we modified heart disease hazard rate, right? um, uh, this would change. But I would argue it's actually affected by other assumptions here too. I would argue that it's also affected by the assumption of cessation rate. Well, that's a bold proposition, right? Is that output on heart disease incidents is affected by cessation rate? But give me an give me an argument. Um, actually, yeah. okay. Um, give me an argument for why um, the uh, yes, why the rate of developing heart disease depends on the cessation rate. Give me an argument. Why? In this model. Why is the empirical observation, the number of occurrences of heart disease over time, why does it depend on the cessation rate? That may seem like really weird thing. Why is my hat? Is it going to depend on cessation rate? The assumption there. Why? Because if you had no cessation, you'd have more people who are what? Who are smokers. And smoking elevates the rate of developing heart disease, right? Hmm? That's why we have this variable over there, right? Um, that's why we have this variable. Over, over here, heart disease hazard rate. It was different here and here. So does your cessation rate, the assumption here, does it affect the, the fraction of people that are here or here? Yeah. Does it affect how many people go down here? You bet it does. If everyone were stuck here, <laughs> once they started smoking, they were stuck here. You'd have a lot more people developing heart disease than if they could quit. If this is super high, then we'd expect a lot more people to be here and, and a comparatively lower rate of heart disease. So this, this, this here plot, yes, it depends on heart disease incident for people who are never smokers, but also depends on the cessation rate, also depends on the relapse rate, wouldn't you say? It depends on the initiation rate for smoking. It's a it's an entangling of all of those. It's some tangled interaction of all of those, right? It's an emergent property. And I would argue two mode time smoke. Does that two minute time smoke? Does it depend on the initiation rate of smoking? Does it depend on cessation rate? Yeah. Does it depend on relapse rate? Yeah. So this is data from the model. And I think you would agree that by and large, there might be some exceptions uh, that one could come up with in a particular model. But by and large, most outputs from the model reflect entangled interactions of a bunch of parameter assumptions. Okay, follow my reasoning. Follow my reasoning. I'll get to those questions. Follow my reasoning, right? Most output from the model reflects not just one parameter value, but a tangled set of them, right? Could this, could some of these potentially be compared against real world data? If we have data on the cumulative time smoke from the behavioral risk factor surveillance system in the US, if we had it from the StatsCan study of, of, of of, of use of um, of nicotine pro uh, um, uh, substances, including nicotine products. If we had empirical data, could we compare this against that? We could. If we had data on heart disease incidents, at least diagnosed cases, we'd have something very closely related to this. If we had data on the fraction of people in the population over time who are smokers or current smokers, former smokers, and never smokers, um, we'd have to make the model more realistic, but we can compare this data with that. And we could study how it varies by age or what have you. So the point is models 
are not just on the receiving end of data, you know, receiving data into their, you know, um, their scary maws. They are, they are also producing data that can be compared to the world. And here's the rub, because we can tweak parameter values that are less well known in the model. We can adjust parameter values that are less well known in the model, where we don't have good estimates collectively, to arrive at assumptions for those parameters that jive with, that are consistent with, that are consonant with this output data from the model. Do you see that? So now suddenly, instead of just focusing on parameter values, getting, you know, data from certain sources for each parameter value in isolation, it opens up, it blows open a set of extra possibilities for estimating parameter values using comparing data output by the model with empirical data. And that, in short, is the basis for, for uh, these, uh, these techniques referred to here, basically calibration of historic data, emergent behavior under defined circumstances, and, and generally the whole filtering, statistical filtering uh, uh, process, like with um, particle filtering and particle MCMC. Um, I think I have a paper co-authored by one Jeff Klassen um, involving PMCMC for a, for a statistical model, in fact, um, which and those processes, when used with these sorts of models, can be used to arrive at parameter estimates for parameters for which you lack a direct way of estimating. Does that mean we arrive at parameter estimates that are the correct ones, that are true? Not necessarily, but at least it rules out implausible assumptions. And often from a given model, case in point, we have many types of outputs, right? It's fairly easy to add more outputs. We could have outputs showing, you know, the number of, of uh, new number of people initiating smoking, you know, per year. We can do it on per on based on their age, these estimates. So if you have data from the world with an HMAS model, we have a lot of flexibility of collecting corresponding data from our model that could be compared with that from the world and calibrated. And a world-class collaborator, or it's a collaborator, a world-class calibrator sits in our presence. And that's one Wade McDonald over there. Wade, Wade walks the walk. He is the veteran, the scarred veteran of many impressive feats of calibration. And I would say Kurt Kruger is also no, no slouch. Um, and without, without, um, well, while being modest, I would say I, the old horse knows the way as well. Um, so, so ladies and gentlemen, when it comes to parameter estimates, we're not at the mercy merely of, of what we can arrive at for, for estimates separately of each parameter. We can leverage this powerful, construct of outputs from the model and calibration or statistical filtering, which is a much more powerful technique yet, to estimate parameter values. And one or two things, and then I'm going to get to those questions. <laughs> um, so I said three ways. Three ways. Okay? Um, so one is this way with calibration. Okay? Another way is with statistical filtering which means basically taking data over time and estimating model state, the state of the model, and you can do it together with parameters jointly for, for tools like PMCMC. And we're, our lab is one of those worldwide that's most advanced in applying that in the health sciences. So we have a number of papers um, related to that. Um, and Wade is applying it for wastewater, et cetera. Um, but there's there's another consideration here for these three ways. Do remember that models are not 
quite as fragile when it comes to parameter values because they also incorporate evidence in the form of structure. And structure constrains behavior. And there are many times where you're uncertain about a parameter, but for your for, for the the other values of the parameters, it's not very sensitive to it. And particularly for nonlinear models, we'll often run a model with sensitivity analysis. Take into account the model structure. We run the model and perform sensitivity analysis, and we find that it's less fragile with respect to this parameter value. It, it, it makes some difference, but it's often very small potatoes. And so we end up not putting a lot of worry into that. Whereas in other case, same proportional error, maybe it's same proportional uncertainty, 50% on either way may make a big difference. And so we use sensitivity analysis, given model structure and other parameter estimates to figure out how sensitive our results are about these assumptions, okay? Um, so, um, oh yeah, and, and one, one final thing. It, it relates to a statement I made earlier in this event. A good model makes itself wrong by motivating. An effective model one that's actually used to inform decision-making will often, not always, change the underlying situation that gave the conditions for which you collected those parameters. So be aware, while you collect parameter estimates, they're not on some inviolate, invariant constant of the universe. They're not, you know, Boltzmann's constant or something. They're not like the speed of light or something like that. They are contingent often on context and the behavioral regime currently in place. And that that changes. And, and an effective model may motivate interventions or changes to the clinical decision making or what have you that render some of those assumptions obsolete and needing to be updated. So a successful model is not just one that predicts accurately. It's something often that motivates action in a way that may render it um, uh, obsolete um, in some of its assumptions. And remember, it's a learning tool. So we're updating it over time. We're, we're using it to, to um, build our understanding in ways that will zero in on a more reliable understanding of the um, uh, of, of of the way the 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 way things are in the world. So I'll I'll just say that. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so the question. So Larissa first. Um, I think Wayne and I have the same one because it's online people. Okay. Um, great. Uh. So I'll do the first one. Mm -hmm. I, the student was wondering if mm -hmm. you could show examples of how to integrate synthetic population from an external data set their geographic distribution and in terms of oh, yeah. exposure to find in geospatial data sets. Yes, yes, I can I can I can address that and we have some models where we read data in from data sets and use it to initialize um uh the population in the model. So for a synthetic uh synthetic uh, uh population so I can I can equip them to be able to examine that, and one of the TAs could wa help walk through that. Yeah, so good. Mm -hmm. By the way, a simulation model, agent-based models are a formidable tools for producing synthetic data sets. I've been in the synthetic data set business, and I, I don't mean like making money off it. It's just like I, I've thought a lot about it and, and have been involved in that. And one of the best ways, the most the most rich way, some of the richest ways to produce synthetic data sets are from simulation models because they are, depict things at an individual level. They capture uh, very nicely automatically by their emergent behavior at an individual level, the covariation between different outcomes for a person. And you can just record people in the model as sort of um, without ethics concerns as 
as having certain characteristics, and you can use it then to test the distal methods. But anyway, where is it? Yes. Uh, further question related to that? Uh, this just a second question. Uh -huh. One of the students struggles with ABM model, puts is applying statistic, often wondering how much is too much. So, so uh, struggles with ABM model and the outputs and applying statistics. Um, so, 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 hum, I'd, I'd have to better understand when we say struggles with applying statistics. I mean, are we talking about like barriers involving like, like formatting the data so you can apply statistical methods or like figuring out what are the right statistical tools to analyze it? Or is it more like, getting overwhelmed by, you know, what data to output and what should I look at with it? And just, you know, being overwhelmed by the, the proliferation of options there. Is it more like that or? Yeah. Hi, Nate. This is Salah here. Yeah. Uh, yes, just, just, just to clarify, great. I was wondering when it comes to the outputs, we often like do them plots. Uh, do yeah. some simple statistics like yeah. chi square t test to look at the differences. But uh, I often wonder uh, if we should apply advanced statistics on them, like clustering, regression, stuff like that. And oh. uh, yeah, so how much is too much? Is that my question? Yeah, so you're saying uh, like that there's because these are rich data sources that can come out of an ABM in principle. Mm -hmm. You could kind of go to town with applying different types of data analysis methods to them, and like how much is too much, as 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 you said, like like um, at what point is there really diminishing returns? Is there? Yep. It's it's no longer no longer helpful. Um. Yeah. Um. I, I'm, I'm not going to provide a good answer to that, but I'll, I'll provide some bad answers <laughs> um, or some answers that have some, some substance. I mean, and, and, and forgive me, it, it, they're, they're, they're more in the lines of platitudes, um, but um, maybe, maybe they're helpful principles. I mean, for, for many models, what you're doing with that model, you know, they, they may have some endpoint in terms of getting, telling stories for policymaking or in terms of publishing certain papers. But along the way, you're trying to learn because learning from them is important to help you make modeling decisions and figure out if this model is effective enough and and figure out if its scope is appropriate, figure out if it's made some unreasonable choices in the structure, you know, describing the structure and so on. And um, it is true that there's diminishing returns there, like in, in terms of, You, you can get overwhelmed by outputting gobs and gobs of information, and especially if you go and you start spending tons and tons of time analyzing it. Um, you know, it's an opportunity cost, right? You, you're taking time away from some other things. And I, I will say this, okay, about this, and, and this is where it gets more, you know, um, if, if you find that engaging with the plots that you have and so on, is adding to your understanding materially. If you find like ahas from it, 
Oh, you understand it better. Ah, there's learning going on. Okay, I realized something I, I hadn't previously understood. If you're finding problems with it by, you know, the the analysis you're conducting, you know, there's a good case to be made that they're delivering value. There's still the question, you know, would that time have been better spent otherwise? Would you have gotten even more insights, found even more issues by, you know, not not putting the, the, the time into that? But, you know, at, at least it's a pretty reasonable, you know, it's a reasonable discussion to have, right? Like um, you, you have a burden a bird in the hand, right? You, you, you're learning these things. Okay. You've, you've gotten good insights. Um, and you might be able to translate those insights for others too. Um, on the other hand, uh, um, you, you could always right forego like, okay. So you have this body of statistical analyses that you can conduct and you can spend your time looking at it, or you could just look at the top few, most important ones and push forward. And, you know, you could actually do have the authenticity of trying, okay, look for four weeks, we're going to do one. And for four other weeks, we're going to do the other. And we'll, we'll ask, where did we learn the most? Like during what four week period of those two, where, where did we learn most effectively? Maybe it's not four weeks, maybe it's two weeks for each. Right. Um, But the point is like, you have the option of doing less, spending less time with that, that you can always undertake um, if you've already created that library. Um, I would be cautious about just creating more and more thinking I will use this. Generally, we'd like to do things incrementally because it's easy to fool yourself with thinking this will be valuable. This will be valuable. Just add one more thing. It's going to be real good later. It's going to be really great. Ah, oh, this is gonna be great. No, no, no. You you wanna build it up incrementally, see value delivered before you go add a bunch more, before you go add a bunch more. Many a modeling project. So over in my lab. There's a book. Maybe it's some paper. There's a lot of my books to walk away from that place. But there's a there's a book that I have 50 surefire ways to kill a software bug. Um and it's, it's from the description, you know, this is one gruesome way of death in a software project. This is another gruesome way of death in a software project. This is another gruesome way in a software project to die. It's like failure modes of a, as an engineer, failure modes of a software project. Someday, I'm probably gonna write 50 surefire ways to kill a modeling project. <laughs> and um, one surefire way is, the bigger, better idea. You know, I'm gonna get there eventually. Well, it's gonna be great. It's gonna be great. You know, just a couple more things, couple more things, and then, then you say, okay, now let's run it. And it's like, what, what weird behavior? Like, where is it coming from? Is this a bug? Is this some weird emergence? Where is it coming from? Um, and maybe along the way, you built up all these grand analyses to be run on it, and you end up not using them or you know, you find, you know, it goes a different direction, the project's canceled, whatever. That, you know, that that way lies matters. Um, and it leads to the big bang problem, where it's a big bang of problems <laughs> that you get at the end of that, of that um, time period. And uh, I know people who have wrecked their models on the shoals of that problem. So instead, what you want to do is you want to learn from the process. You want to try something. You want to add maybe a few more analyses. You know, try them out. Get a feel for them. See if you're learning from the before adding more. Try a little bit more. Try uh, try learning more. Add a little bit more in. You know, try learning more. Um, and because you, you want to test it with the authenticity of putting it into practice. And you don't want to do a lot of speculative work. In the software area, I teach software engineering as well. And in the software area, there's a there's a, an acronym. Yeah, I can. Yeah, ain't gonna need it. 
don't over engineer it. Like don't put all the work in there thinking it's going to be great eventually and, and you put all this effort in and it turns out like you never to get there. It doesn't, doesn't end up, you know, panning out or it's, or it's inscrutable and you, you don't get value from it. You get value by learning in the doing, by adding things in, learning what to do next, using that to inform. And you arrive at a much savvier model in the end. Maybe it's a big, beautiful, great model with lots of analyses, but they're savvy analyses. They're informed by the authenticity of having learned from them against in the crucible of real use, not based on speculation. You, you inform your choice of how much to put into place, how many analyses by doing and by observing are you delivering value. So um, I hope that I hope that crude answer offers some modicum of value. Take it from an old man. I've been there. Done that. Any other questions online? Any other questions in the room? Mm -hmm. Speak on. To uh, the agent agent based model with one million agents, and he said yes. He did that. Run. And that's uh, how long? How long did it take them to inform the loan on that? Like, is there any technique in our lab where you need to increase the computational efficiency? Save our time. Because, for example, one million uh, agents, we spend like three or four months or one year, or I don't know, like to run a model and like, suddenly oh. found the results. Is oh, it's not. It's not like. It's not like months. No, um, it's it, it. Yeah, I mean, you're you're one or you're one or two units up. Um, um, but but it, it does slow down. It, it gets slower. There are lots of computational. There are lots and lots of computational ways. But I'm afraid that I will put approximately two thirds of the boot camp. If they're not already asleep, I will afraid that I will I will place them into the cave of Morpheus. Um or they will run from this here lab, you know, stark raving mad. Um okay, I'm I'm overly dramatizing it, but there are lots and lots of opportunities, and they're not that hard, and they ain't rocket science. And we know how to do a lot of them in the lab. And that gentleman is a master at many of them, okay? Um, he built he built models that are pragmatic, that that scale and, and last, uh, like the COVID model that we built in March, March 2020. I think started in February 2020, before it was a pandemic, right? Um, and which is still delivering results today, um, and which is probably running right now for certain scenarios in our lab for Alberta. I don't, I don't know if it's about what the doctor way. but yeah, no, these models are built to last, and they are effective because they have that right balance. But there's a lot more we can do with control over the platform with control over, over how it's captured. There's lots of opportunities. And there are, let, let's let's say with uh, with any logic, there are lots of ways you can do it much faster than if you're not used about it. And we can share those ways. And in this boot camp, there have been times where I give a performance lecture and I talk about many of the basics of that, at least well, I don't give you the best way to do it, but I give you many bad ways not to do it. <laughs> and you often have a choice between three different ways. One of them is hideous. And two of them are at least pretty good. And you can really improve greatly 
your your model speed by applying some some basic principles. But then there's ways we can take that much further with more serious work. And and we know where where the goods are buried. Yeah. So uh, in a similar vein, if you is uh, what would be the performance difference between any logic and recreating the exact same ABM in some sort of say C plus plus framework or something? Like would would that be like a night and day difference, or is that over over optimization for how much effort that would be? Rust or Julia, young man. Yeah. C plus plus these days. Um, I've written. <laughs> I've written 300 to 500,000 lines of C++ code myself. Okay. So I'm not, I'm not naive about it. I've been there, done that. And, and I wouldn't do it in C++, but Rust, Rust, I'd, I'd do it. Um, seriously, uh, Julia, I'd consider doing it. Um, uh, is it faster? I mean, it's not going to be a hundred times faster. Um, I if if I had to to get look if you're not doing it badly in any logic there's lots of ways to do it badly in any logic like but there's ways to do it badly in any language right like okay th this could get too technical like <laughs> we we want to I've already been on one tear you don't want me in another right um but but it, it, you know, you shouldn't think it's like 100 on, kind of like, no, no, no. It's, I will say there are packages which run into serious problems. And um, uh, NetLogo has some great, great strengths, but do not use it over 50,000 agents. Like you will, you will cry. Um, it, it will not be a happy experience. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's a great tool for, for getting started. Don't get me on about the language, okay? Um, but but yeah, I mean, you th there are strict limits, but this is not something where you're going to get like giant stamp beat up. But you will get several. If I had to venture, I bet you could get it running. You know, many uh, several times faster. I, could you could you get me to believe that if you did this? Carefully, but not abusively low level way in Rust, I could get a five times speed up with good memory management. Yeah, yeah, like Rust anymore. Yeah, but but it's going to be a code base that stakeholders are not going to understand. You're not going to be able to show it to stakeholders. You may win the battle, but lose the war because you build a model that nobody has buy into, nobody uses, no one has a sense of ownership. You haven't gotten the experts. So it, it may be a model that technically shines in terms of speed, but it's sound full of sound and fury. It signifies nothing possible. But let's not get me on a tear. Yeah. Um, I, okay. I have some more questions, but we'll... Yeah. <laughs> um, wait. No, I just want to say, um, I, if you, Jay, or anyone else wants to talk, Stuff yeah, there's there's a whole discussion. Yeah, no, Wade would be an awesome person to talk about. You know, I'd also be glad to talk about it in the right setting. This is not the right the right time or the right place. No. Um, there could be a break off session optional while people are working on on um, projects or something like that. But but. Um, um, I mean, the boot camp is fine for it. It's just not forcing everyone to hear and recognizing that I need to speak at a level that's different than when speaking to computer scientists, right? Um, they don't want to hear about, you know, low level optimization of thread level parallelism or something. Let's not go there. Let's not go there. Yeah. Okay. Were you good? Okay. Let's take a break. We're going to take a break for 10 minutes. Okay. And and we'll be back and we'll get into um, implementing some interventions, seeing the results on this year model. And then we're going to spend much of our day on context, particularly networks. And we might see um, some spatial context captured by the end of the day as well. Thank you very much for some great questions. 
thank you folks um, online and here in the room for bringing forward those questions. That's what allows us to deliver value for your needs. And I'd like to encourage it. Okay, we'll be back in 10.